What makes pride? We've been taught that pride is sinful, selfish, arrogant, deadly, but we know better. Pride is not deadly, hate is. Hate is the violence trying to make us small, silent, invisible, extinct. Pride is the extravagant, unapologetic embrace of our wholeness. Pride is the affirmation of our humanity. Pride announces we are here on our own terms. And for pride to be real, it must confront all the hate that seeks to destroy. Pride must battle white supremacy. It must end poverty. It must uproot patriarchy. Pride must liberate, house, clothe, and build. I am Melissa Harris Perry, and this month I'm partnering with PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization, to lead a series of conversations with BIPOC, queer, and trans folk who are organizing transformational work in our communities. Join us every Tuesday in the month of June on PFLAG.org. Welcome, I'm Melissa Harris Perry, and I'm your host this month for a series of conversations that we're calling What Makes Pride. Now, each week during the month of June, I'll be joined by leaders who are tackling critical issues facing BIPOC, queer, and trans communities through advocacy, activism, arts, and we'll call it creative maladjustment. This week, we are discussing community. And as we begin our discussion of community, I want to do so with the words of the self-described Black lesbian mother warrior poet, Audre Lorde. A writer and activist, Lorde's life, work, and wisdom are touchstones and guiding lights for those who seek to build community at the intersections. Now, reflecting on issues of difference and diversity in community, Lorde told author Claudia Tate in a 1981 interview, in our work, and in our living, we must recognize that difference is a reason for celebration and growth rather than a reason for destruction. In an essay titled, The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action, Lord explained the importance of being honest about the full, complicated, messy nature of our humanity. She wrote, I have a duty to speak the truth as I see it and share not just my triumphs, not just the things that felt good, but the pain, the intense, often unmitigated pain. It's important to share how I know survival is survival and not just a walk through the rain. During a 1982 Harvard University lecture, Lord explained why it is critical that even as people build community, that community is not allowed to define and destroy the people who are building it. She said, If I didn't define myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And in her magnificent collection, A Burst of Light and Other Essays, Audre Lorde articulated the social and political relevance of nurturing her full humanity as a Black queer person. Writing, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. So I want to suggest that we think of these as the Audrey principles for building community. One, embrace the diverse, divergent, very ways of being within community. Two, be radically honest and unconditionally loving about the full complexity of every person's lived experience. Three, Be determined in defiance against harmful, limited, externally imposed norms. And four, practice unconditional self-love and kindness as a precondition to transformation of oppressive social and political systems. Now, the world lost Audre Lorde in 1992, but her principles for community building remain with us. And the legacy of Lord's transformative work remains alive with the BIPOC, queer, and trans activists determined to ensure their community survives, thrives, despite hate and hostility and violence. 
Today, I have two visionary guests who are joining me to discuss the ways that BIPOC, queer, and trans folk are creating communities of healing and liberation. Kirby Joseph is the Safe Outside the System Coordinator for the Audre Lorde Project, based in Brooklyn, New York, and Brooklyn-based rapper, community organizer, and founder of For the Girls, Asadi Arman, is also with us. Thank you both for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I, I'm so happy to, to meet you both in this space. Asadi, I actually want to begin with you because um, you started with For the Girls um, in a way of both of building community in two ways, both with the parties and with the support that the parties were providing. So I just want you to kind of tell folks, what is it that For the Girls does? Sure. So we are an organization that fundraises on behalf of Black trans people in order to help them pay for their rent and their affirmative surgeries. Um, and we were doing that in the very beginning by hosting parties. Um, and instead of, you know, using the proceeds for something else, I would take all the money from ticket sales and put that towards someone's rent uh, or someone's affirmative surgery. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and so we, well, I guess a little bit before the pandemic hit, we started to fundraise online as well. And so when the pandemic hit, we just took everything online. And so now we kind of just crowdfund online and use the money that we raise to help people with their rent and their affirmative surgeries, as well as pay for their medical uh, co-pays for doctor's visits uh, and medicines and things of that nature as well. Now, is it your goal to get back to parties, to get back to, because it feels to me like on the one hand, there it may be more efficient in some ways to uh, raise money in an online system, but it's also a little less community building. Once the pandemic begins to finally clear, is it your goal to get back to being together? I think so. I think the more that I think about it, I think I want to get back to that aspect of community building. I think we've had to learn how to build community online. I think that's been helpful in some way, in many ways, um, but there's nothing like being together in person. Um, and so the more I think about it, the more I am interested in building that community uh, again in person. So I'm considering it, but health and safety come first. And so, you know, I don't, it would really hurt me to cause harm to some people that I care about, right? So right. Uh, we're trying to figure that out. Absolutely. Stick with, don't go, but Kirby, I want to basically ask you the same kind of question about the Audrey Lord Project, which is, I want you to tell folks what it is you all do. Now, y'all do a lot, um, but I but I really want to have a sense of, um, if you are, if you're in the elevator, right, what's your elevator speech about what Audrey Lord Project does? Yeah, so the Audrey Lord Project was founded in 1994, opened its doors in 1996, um, and has been around since then. And the goal of Audrey Lord Project is to allow lesbian, gay, transgender, two-spirit, which is a indigenous identity of two-spirit, um, well, it's a political identity of um, two-spirit, femininity, masculinity within one person, um, gender non conforming people, to have an organizing center within New York City. So the goal is to actually build leaders um, and comrades within the movement through the politic of a radical Black feminist lens and transformative justice. So we are completely moving our members and our community members to one, be empowered, love yourself, which is hard work, um, fight against the system and fight for something new um, through the skills that they learn every day by being part of community and skills that they already have. Um, and the programs that we have at the Audrey Project right now is the Safe Outside the System Collective. We're probably going to get into that a little bit later. Um, Trans Justice, um, those are comrades that organize the Rick Rubber campaign, which is a housing campaign, um, and Trans Day of Action here in New York. Um, Third Space, which is a holistic wing, providing healing, wellness, and care to our communities. It's so interesting that you use that quote because that is the main quote of Third Space. Um, and Mel C, um, our folks who are coming in are being streamed um, into these different programs and, and working with folks. Um, shout out to our comrade that's here um, with this work that you're moving um, in a virtual way. Our work right now within ALP is virtual. Everything mm -hmm. had to shift. Our community was hit so hard by the pandemic um, and underreported how hard it was hit that the narrative had to change, but because people wanted to be around each other, 
um, and wanted to be in community, they tapped in to every aspect of what was being offered to them, as long as they can feel some type of connection. So Kirby, you've gone to exactly the question that I really wanted to sort of open up with both of you, which is, um, <laughs> one, we know that data are almost always going to undercount and underreport what is happening in queer and trans communities, especially around vulnerabilities, right? So we know that because of how we collect data, um, public health data, for example, we're not going to have the full picture. But there's also lots of reasons to believe, right, that BIPOC, queer and trans communities were clearly the most vulnerable in the context of a contagious pandemic that requires you to, to be to have a job where you are at home, right? Where you're um, to, to, to have like access to all kinds of resources in order to so-called stay safe. And that all communities where people weren't able to just shelter away had greater vulnerability, greater infection rates, greater death rates. So here's my question. What was the work of building community in this past year, year and a half as you are again, trying to, to build in all of the things that pre-existed and then this pandemic on top of it? One of the things that we had to do is literally see where our members and our comrades and our community members were. Calling people, <laughs> reaching out to people, asking folks if they heard from so-and-so because we haven't been able to get in touch with them. Literally, what place our community members were. Because there are some folks that we couldn't account for, right? And having a space um, at AOP, um, my office in Brooklyn, was actually a stop in the Underground Railroad. So a whole nother legacy. But <laughs> but having a space allowed for members to stop in. So even if we had like some of our TJ or Trans Justice members, right? Some of our OG members who didn't really have a phone, they could have stopped in at the office to show us that they were okay. We had to go out looking for folks, calling folks, social media and folks. Um, to find out where they were. So that was one, making sure that our communication was tight. Another thing was finding out if they had the things that they were that they needed. Um, we were literally delivering food um, and resources to our members, right? Um, and people who weren't necessarily ALP members, but were community members, right? We're part of the LGBT STGNC community. So we were literally providing the resources that we knew <laughs> the system wasn't going to provide for them because um, it never had. Um, and also when the uprising started to happen um, and our members wanted to go outside, we developed a security system to make sure that our members were safe at actions, right? That they let us know that they were at actions, that they let us know when they got home. Um, hmm. We were training our community members at large and our allies, different organizations that work with us in de-escalation, in security, to make sure that our community members, especially our TGNC comrades who are always victim of police violence at any step of the way, especially mm -hmm. at action, were protected. So it was this interpersonal aspect of checking in, of providing resources, of making sure that people have housing. Um, we have a fund called Live Against Violence Fund, where if people who are experiencing state violence um, or inter interpersonal, intercommunity violence need some financial assistance, they can get some of that. Um, and that's housed within the Safe Outside the System Collective that we're providing our members with that so they can get food to eat or they can pay their medical bills. And we still had folks during the pandemic um, who were getting gender assignment surgery and we had to mm -hmm. safety plan um, with them, mm -hmm. provide um, other members to provide them care. Um, and we really developed like this tree system, right? So we have a tree. We all have a tree in our city, mm -hmm. <laughs> all of us. Um, but we really um, had to tap in and structuralize that tree because we needed to make sure that everyone was okay. So Kirby, you brought up an issue that I want to go to Asani on because the question of safety or of security in the context of the uprisings around the movement for Black Lives this summer, on the one hand is about state violence. But Asani, I, I also really want to go with you um, on something I've, I've read and, and heard you talk about previously, which is, yes, state violence, but also intra-community violence. And that especially for trans women, the likelihood of being victimized on the street in a moment like that is as likely to come from the brother you are walking next to, right, as it is, or the sister you're walking next to, right, from a cis Black person, 
as it is to come from police officers. So I'm interested in the challenges and having you articulate the challenges of trying to build community when the community that you're part of um, is just as willing to be violent um, as uh, the communities that you're both organizing over and against. Totally. Um, before I get to that, I wanted to a- uh, answer your first, the first part of your question. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, and so, uh, Kirby, I applaud all the work that ALP did. I, I was, I saw my own two eyes, like many of my friends benefited from that work. So I very much so applaud it. Um, in a similar vein, we had to do a lot of, we had to really go back to the basics, right? We had to really stop and say, well, how is the pandemic particularly affecting Black trans people? A lot of Black trans people are in-person workers, gig workers, sex workers, right? Requiring them to be around people. And in the pandemic, you cannot necessarily engage in sex work in the same ways you could prior to. Um, you cannot engage, you can't really perform anywhere. The, the venues are shut down. Um, and you know, the your average job more often, more likely than not, is not actually giving Black trans people that opportunity because of institutionalized transphobia um, and anti-Blackness. And so we had to, we really just started putting out tweets asking people, what is it, what can we do to tangibly show up for people? We know that we're already doing rent, we're already doing affirmative surgeries, but what are other ways that FTG can uh, tangibly show up for Black trans people? And someone tweeted us and said something to the effect of not being able to afford their medicines. Um, And that's how we started. That's where I came up with the idea for the medical fund, which is a little bit confusing because affirmative surgeries are also a medical thing, but the medical fund specifically provides smaller grants to people to help them pay for copay, pay for medicine, and travel to a a clinic or wherever they get their medicines from without having to get public transportation because we know some cities were shutting down public transportation altogether. Some cities were shutting it down in certain places. Also, for a black trans person trying to get on the train, it's its own issue. Sometimes violence happens there. And so just trying to kind of circumvent that all together, we started to fundraise money to help also provide rides to and from a facility or wherever you get your uh, medicines. And so that was one thing that we did. Also speaking to the uprisings, right? Helping pay for rides back and forth to uprisings. Uh, actually helping organize uh, the uprisings. Like one of the, the the Brooklyn Liberation March that happened back, I wanna say in June, we were a part of helping organize that from the back end, even though I necessarily didn't want to go out because of the pandemic and because of uh, illnesses that I have, I didn't want to necessarily put myself at risk. Um, we were helping organize those things in the background. Um, and to your point about, um, about inter- intracommunal violence, right? It's always such a, unnecessarily sticky topic, I think, because the arguments oftentimes are then pushed towards where you're leaning into white supremacist logics of black on black crime, which is not the same thing, because black on black crime doesn't exist, right? Um, But what we are saying is that while black on black crime does not exist, what does exist is people who have benefit from systems of power being able to use that benefit to actually cause harm, including death, for people who do not benefit. And so in the same way we can talk about how white people are able to enact violence on black bodies and black people and allow them to be murdered in the middle of the street uh, and really make excuses for it. It's the same way that this can happen to black trans people by virtue of the same white supremacist logics. Um, and FTG has had to really kind of, we're always kind of being asked to justify why we are doing the work that we do specifically for black trans people because mm-hmm. people see the success that we've had and then they say, well, why aren't you doing this for black people writ large? And then, you know, when you go into the specific details about, well, this is what this community, this community faces specifically, then it becomes, now you're talking about black on black crime, which is not what's happening. <laughs> so um, truthfully, I more often than not, we are left out of the conversation. I think when we were talking about black community and black support. I think that that's kind of the nature of, of the beast when you're doing work specifically for part, particular parts of a community that are overlooked, undervalued, disrespected, left out to be murdered, not only by the state, but by the communities that are also left out to be murdered by the state. I so appreciate the way that you articulated that and that um, particularly I like your language of it's almost unnecessarily sticky. 
it is um, it is that challenge of 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 building community at the intersections when you you <laughs> right you're silenced from talking about that violence because right because we know there are vulnerabilities even from those who are enacting the violence and yet right to be silent as Audre Lorde might right have reminded us is to is to participate in it right and to participate in the oppression of one's self and of one's broader community. They'll so kill tell you that you enjoyed it. Will you say it one more time? Because I feel like I stepped on you there. Say it one more time. They'll kill you and they'll tell you that you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the principles ALP works from Kirby is um, you all have it uh, written much more um, beautifully, but this idea of nothing about us without us. That um, that policy will not be made for you. You will not be led. You will lead yourself. I will lead myself. We will lead ourselves in community, and that that's what you're doing with this community building leadership in part. So talk to me about how that is operationalized at ALP. This idea of nothing about us without us. How are you um, helping to prepare as a matter of? Um, uh, the various kinds of work that you do to ensure that policies aren't made for you, but that you're making the policies. Anybody who wants liberation has to first start within themselves. We have to liberate ourselves, right? So what that means is that we have to understand what self-determination is and gain self-determination. And when you have been stepped on and had a boot on your neck for your whole existence, um, and every aspect of who you are, how you express yourself, your identity, your skin color, right, is literally labeled wrong within the system. It doesn't leave a lot of room for you to build self-determination, empowerment for yourself, to even organize anything. And at the root of our work at ALP and at any community work, really, is teaching folks self-determination, right? That they are valuable, right? That they deserve to exist, right? That their existence isn't in vain. And the only way that we can do that is together, right? That your comrade needs you to stand with them, right? To have compassion and care for them, right? Um, and needs you to provide space for them because this system doesn't provide space for us, right? You can live in your home and kind of walk around, but your home can be taken away from you. Your life can be taken away from you. Um, from not only interpersonal violence that's indoctrinated in our community members in the first place, um, but by policies, right, that allow that violence to happen. This system is violent in general, right? Um, and in order for anything to shift, we have to have that self-determination, that empowerment in ourselves to care enough about ourselves to make a difference. So self-love mm -hmm. and love in general is like one of the key principles that you need for liberation to fight, right? Like we're doing work for people that we've never met, that may never know our name, that mm -hmm. may never watch this episode, but still needs the fun that you're mm -hmm. providing, right? Or it needs the, the work that we're doing. But if we don't make room to love our comrades, even when they don't love themselves, right? Even when they may not love us, then we can't bring about any type of liberation. And I think it's very real for people to understand that any shifts that happen in our society, all of them historically, is only because of people power, hmm. only, right? Politicians, uh, you know, institutions are not shifting what they're doing out the kindness of their heart. They're not waking up one day. <laughs> like, oh my God. You know, I was wrong. <laughs> oh no. And and the and the reforms that they make aren't even enough. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a, a little bit of what we need, right? But the only reason why anything is put to the table in the first place is because that process of care of love, of self-determination, of solidarity was put into individuals who 
became leaders who spread it out to our community to make enough of a shake <laughs> that they had to pay attention to our conditions, right? That they had to listen to our demands. Um, we were talking about, you know, George Floyd earlier. The only reason why there was a guilty verdict is because we experienced the largest civil rights movement in our country's history within our generation. Because millions of people in this country and all over the world, right, came together and shook up the institution, right? Um, shook up the state, the courts, the police, <laughs> the schools, um, all the institutions that marginalize our communities even further. But it starts from one, right? And it starts from that care that that mentor gave you, right? That that big sis gave you, that that comrade gave you, that told you that you are worthy enough to deserve better and gave you the skills to do that to other community members. I love everything about your response and that notion of how we build out and we build out from, from a core self. Also, especially this, um, that we can manage to love those who don't love us back and don't necessarily even love themselves, but we're, because we're building. Asani, I want to go to you on one of the tools for building that you have used so effectively and that I think actually is just sort of part of what Black folks use to build community. And that's culture, art, music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, the moment when I finally started to feel the sadness of what um, COVID was doing to us in terms of separating all of us was club quarantine. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, so we gonna get together and have oh, go a house party. Okay, great. Like, and I didn't even realize I needed it, but I needed it, right? I actually needed a party in order, and I needed a party with other black folks listening to the music that is our music to start to get through. So I'm interested in how you use music, how you use culture, how you use art, how you use that creation of something mm -hmm. to also help do the work that we just heard Kirby talking about. Totally. Um, the reason that we, the reason I originally came up with using a party to fundraise for Black people, one, two of my close friends needed help with some, with, with rent. Um, they were both facing eviction and I didn't know how to necessarily fundraise outside of like throwing a party. I know that Black queer folks we party all the time. Like going back to what Langston Hughes has written about and other Black artists, Black queer artists, the club, the party, the discotheque has been a sort of like sanctuary for Black people. We've always kind of had to, especially Black queer people, especially Black trans people, we've kind of had to rush to the, to the, the ball, to the bar, to the club, because we were pushed out of homes, we were pushed out of shelters, we were pushed out of churches, we were pushed out of everything else that was supposed to be a sanctuary. And so what was left was the party. And so thinking about that, it just kind of was a no brainer to put the two and two together and say, you know what, actually, if I throw a party and I charge people a small amount of money and tell them what it's going towards, we can use this to help people. Um, and it was from there, um, the first party that a, a black trans woman, another friend of mine came up to me and said, it would be nice if you did this every month. Um, and at the time I was like, eh, I don't know if I can do it um, because I was starting my own job and you know all these other things. And so I, I didn't know if I could commit to that. But by the end of the, the party, I was like, okay, well, I party all the time. There's at least one weekend I can do something good with it. <laughs> so, <Listen. laughs> and so, yeah, no, to your, to answer your question more broadly, yes, we have to turn, we have to turn art, we have to turn music, we have to turn dancing into, um, or not even turn it into a tool of safety, a tool of, um, a, a tool of safety because it's always been that for us. It's kind of always been that for us. as far back as pre-colonial, pre-slavery. Like we've always kind of used music and art dance and song as as a people to communicate, to love one another, to be in community with one another. And I think that FTG is just one of many con continuations of that. All right, so we're gonna end on what I'm gonna call a little queer Afrofuturism. I want you to you can close your eyes, you can keep them open, whatever, but I want you to just go into your head or into your heart, your spirit, and I want you to spin out from me what a free future would look like, a free and equal, a good, a loving, a nurturing, a life-giving future. I wanna know what it smells like. I wanna know what it sounds like. I wanna know what it feels like. I just, I feel like sometimes we, we get so much in a space of 
talking about the trauma, but I want to hear what, if I plop you down right now in the, in the, the middle of freedom, joy, equality, possibility, love, what is it like? And either one of y'all can start and then I'll have the other one of y'all finish it up. Um, to me, it's a world with no prisons, no police, um, no need, there, no need for institutional institutions when it comes to institutionalized like racism, transphobia, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, but also no need for uh, anti-black policing institution because we don't need policing. You know, we have healthcare that's free for everyone and that healthcare is not going to discriminate against you because you are black, because you are trans, because you are fat or anything like that. It is a healthcare that is open and free to all to get you the best medical care that you need. We don't have a capitalist system where you need to have to have money and you have to do a job in order to pay for your rent. Your housing is free, your food is free. So whatever you decide to do, you're doing it simply because you love it, not because it has to put food on your table. Um, or keep a roof over your head because all of that is already provided. The art that we make is devoid of the white gaze. We're making it because you want to make it, not because you care about what white people have to say about it or what white people think about it or what black people who care about what white people think about are going to say about it. You make your art because you want to make your art. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what Listen, I said. I'm for that vision. Yes. <laughs> Kirby, you want to give us your freedom dream? Yeah, uh, I want a community with de-escalators, folks who are trained in community safety and de-escalation are the ones that we call when we're in danger, right? So 911 is full of cutie pop, black, radical folks who are holistic, who are taking care of our communities and responding to emotional mental distress, right? I want a community with no evictions because housing is a human right and everybody deserves housing that nobody feels scared to go to the hospital because we don't have to worry about the medical industrial complex anymore, right? That we can be our queer TGNC selves because we're not being fetishized by the internet, by the media, or by white misogynist culture, right? Um, that education is free and nobody's sitting here struggling worrying about student debt. Um, that's cutting their pockets that they have to worry about for the rest amen. of the Amen. Amen. Whatever. Amen. <laughs> and that our elders actually have a way to retire, right? And there's mm -hmm. no need to worry about their social security coming into jeopardy. And there's no need to worry about a funeral fund because we'll be able to bury yeah. our elders and have tradition for our elders. Um, I want our society to be holistic, that everyone has an altar if they need one, that everyone burns mm -hmm. sage if they want to. Um, and people love each other, um, a place where harm is less, right? Um, and we reach the dream of safer societies um, because we develop the structures that we need to, right? Um, and that we're not arguing amongst each other, but actually we came together, built that community, found our liberation, and, and went after those targets that caused us that harm. Um, and we live in a system that we built together, um, this beautiful, diverse, system that before capitalism entered human society existed. Um, and, and more conversations like these. Um, I want this to be what's on TV. This should be on Bravo, right? This should be on VH1. Uh, and not loving activism. That's not what I'm talking about. But <laughs> I was like, we could, but we, well, I think we'd have to go to the parties even more than once a month. Right. <laughs> But like actual, like having yeah. conversations and struggling through it, even if I don't have the same ideology as you, right? But that we can struggle through that conversation because we're not worried about being shamed for our thoughts and we're not scared to be educated um, if our thoughts are a little problematic. Um, and that we're not doing cancel culture, right? Or <laughs> call our culture online, but we're talking to each other directly because we feel safe enough to talk to each other directly. Um, I just want our our free, beautiful society to feel safe. Um, that's our goal in LP. That's what the goal in 1969, right? When our comrades took over Stonewall and shut it down, no matter how pink washed that history is, they did it for their safety. You know, that's what our comrade is doing before the girls is keeping people safe. Um, but it shouldn't be an underground economy. It should be our economy and our system as a whole. 
I'm gonna, I want us to be able to sit in that in that future with free education, free food, housing that is provided, that sense of human right, but also just um, that tension or not tension, but so that it wouldn't be a tension, that you can be seen, you can be visible, you can be present, but not under the gaze, mm -hmm. not under the, um, the judgment, the institutionalized hatred. Um, that is a that is an experience that some people live in right now. It would be different if what you had suggested, Kirby, Asani, if what you had suggested was something that no person has ever lived, mm -hmm. but sufficient food, sufficient housing, um, sufficient freedom, sense of safety, ability to move through the world, representing yourself, making your own art. There are people who live that. And so um, it is not outlandish, outrageous, impossible, um, but it certainly, it certainly is a gift for both of you um, to have articulated it so beautifully for all of us. Yeah. And Thank I you so much. Oh, please. No, just what you're saying that is possible because it, it does exist, that just making it clear that we understand as LGBT, FTG, and C, community members, that there's a choice being made in our system, right? That literally is not being made for our benefit and that we are literally creating these spaces to fight against those choices. Um, it's something that has been done forever, but it's something that when you process it and think about that, that there are folks who are in power who every day make decisions that literally impact our lives in the most disastrous ways. It only shows that, especially during Pride, um, that we actually have to keep on fighting um, until we can have that reality that's possible in other places. Because we know it's possible. Um, it's not a dream. Kirby, where can people find you and how can they support your work? Um, so if anybody wants to plug in into the Safe Outside the System work, learn about verbal, physical de-escalation, safety planning, um, community security, you can email me at K-E-R-B-I-E at AOP.org. That is my email. If anybody wants to reach me personally, you can find me on Instagram at K-E-R-B-I-E-J-88, Kirby J88 on IG. And Asani, same question for you. Where can people find you and how can they support your work? Sure. Um, donations are the biggest thing that we need because we're yes. always sending money directly to Black trans people. So if you want to donate to us, uh, you can go to F O R T H E G W O R L S dot com dot party slash donate. Um, and if you want to follow us on social media on Instagram and Facebook, we are F O R T H E G W O R L S. And on Twitter, we are the number four T H E G W O R L S. And if you want to follow me personally, I'm at Asani Armand on everything. So A S A N N I A R M O N. And I'm just going to repeat that money is critical for getting to this vision that we just talked about. We may be anti-capitalist, but in the process of creating an anti-capitalist world, we must have resources for folks. So I'm going to say again, y'all can feel free in this moment if you're wondering, what can I do in Pride Month? Here is what you can do in Pride Month. Let's support for the girls. Let's support Audrey Lord, not only by resharing this episode, do that, but also maybe make a little donation. Make this the day that you make sure that you are providing your resources in a way that are building that world. Kirby Joseph of the Audrey Lord Project and Asani Arman of For the Girls, thank you both for joining me for What Makes Pride. Now, up next, we have original music by. Tomu DJ. And if you have been watching this series all month long, then you already know Tomu DJ's unique and engaging sonic style. And if you're new to our series, I know you're going to enjoy it. Tomu DJ is an American producer and DJ best known for her groundbreaking self-released projects on Bandcamp. And you can follow her at Tomu DJ on all platforms. And don't go away. I got one more last word for you before we sign out.
All right, that's it for this episode of What Makes Pride, brought to you by PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization. I'm your host, Melissa Harris-Perry, and I thank you for joining us. Now listen, remember to tune in for next week's episode. Next week, we're going to talk about the concept of family. We have two really incredible conversations on tap for you. You do not want to miss these. I can tell you there are some emotions to learn more about our guests, particularly today's guests. And in order to support the important work they're doing to build community, go to pflag.org. There you're going to find links and suggested ways to support and to get involved. Okay, y'all stay as safe as you can, be good to one another and have a little pride. 